welcome to our Neighborhood Watch meeting. My name is Kari Garcia, and I am the chair of the Neighborhood Watch Committee for Miracle Mile Residential Association and also the VP of the MMRA. So welcome tonight. I'm really glad you're all joining us. Um, these meetings are so important. They are designed to give you information, designed for us to enhance our communication. Um, and tonight's meeting is really in response to a little rash of crime uh, that primarily occurred on Ridgely a few weeks ago, and also we noticed there was some crime on Cloverdale, Cochrane. Um, there was a few incidents that really told me it's time for us to meet again and discuss what we can do. And I would love for you guys to hear me talk all night about our Neighborhood Watch program, but I really feel it's best to give you the facts from LAPD with Officer Green, and I think it's really important to get the best tips possible. And I um, looked for that and found that in SSA a Security Company with Officer Brian Liddy, who is with us this evening. He's going to give you tips exactly on how you can protect yourself and your uh, car and your home. So I think it'll be a very informative evening. And what we're going to do is um, have Officer Green speak unless he is late logging on, and then we'll flip things around. Um, and then uh, Officer Liddy with SSA Security Company will give you the tips, the pro tips that you probably logged on for. And um, I'll say a few words myself, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And to keep things um, manageable, if you could put your questions in the Q&A, I have arm twisted my daughter um, into helping co-host. These things uh, with Zoom and technology can be a bit above me. So if there's any glitches, don't blame me, blame her. Just kidding. Um, and that's really the format for this evening. So I think we've got almost everybody on here. And again, a call out to Officer Green. If you are on, uh, unmute yourself and let me know. Um, and if not, we will flip things around. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. And it's not too late if you have a neighbor who would enjoy this and benefit from uh, this meeting. And really, that's what it's all about, is that we all are doing the same thing. Send them a link and invite them to join us this evening. Um, let's see. What else I wanted to let you know, um, I really wanted to do a huge call out to our block captains. Our block captains are probably the most important part of our neighborhood watch. They are the ones that are getting the emails to you. They're communicating. They're providing structure on your block. They are an invaluable research resource. I can't thank them enough, and you should thank them as well. So here is a round of applause for all of our block captains tonight. Um, thank you all very much. You guys are really important. We actually started five years ago with 30 block captains, and um, we still have the same 30. I think we swapped out a few. Sorry, Officer Green is having a hard time logging in. So I am going to see if I can help him here for a second. Um, let me just give him a quick message. I'll ask for your patience just for one minute while I multitask. Okay. All right. We'll see if you can log in. Apologies for that. Um, but what we will do is um, uh, start off with uh, pretty much the goals for this evening was what's going to have Officer Green give us the crime stats, which we will um, work on. But we also want to hear from um, SSA Security Company um, Officer Brian Liddy. And so I think what we'll do, Officer Liddy, if you're okay, is we're going to flip things around a little bit. Um, the, yeah. And I'll start off uh, just a few things that before we get the actual crime stats from Officer Green would be that uh, the crimes that we were noticing, especially on Ridgely, was a burglary um, of a residence. Okay. Um, and we also noticed catalytic converter theft, uh, theft, burglary theft from a vehicle where an iPad was stolen. Um, and I think they had another incident. These, this all happened within, I think, like a seven or nine day period. Okay. So um, the problem uh, also occurred on Cloverdale and Co Cochrane with residential burglaries. And so I wanted to get those exact facts from Officer Green. But I'm going to first turn it over to 
um, Officer Liddy from SSA, Brian Liddy, Officer Brian Liddy, excuse me. And while you get going on that, I'm going to um, work on getting Officer Green on board. So we'll just flip things around, but you will still receive all the same information. Check the chat for the links that you're going to want to copy. So right click, highlight everything and save those links. And then um, also put your questions in the chat so that we can address those questions later. And if you can all keep yourself muted, that would be great. I'll try to get rid of that doorbell, sorry about that. Um, but I'd like to give a warm welcome to SSA Officer Brian Liddy. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. And if you could give us um, the pro tip starting pretty much in order. Um, and again, we have all the handouts. They're all PDFs in uh, the link in the chat. Uh, if you could start off, Officer Liddy, with discussing how we can really keep our cars safe and then our person safe on the street, um, mm -hmm. our cars, vehicles, and then um, end with how to keep our uh, self safe in our homes, given the current climate and maybe a little introduction as to where uh, the crimes that you've seen in the neighborhoods, because they're all neighborhoods around here with Brookside, Hancock Park, Hancock La Brea. Give us a little, um, you know, what's the vibe on the street, if you will, and what you're seeing and then how we can address that. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, so we'll start off with probably the most important aspect of it is that protecting yourself while you're even in this day and age. Sadly, you have to be well knowing of your surroundings everywhere. Um, just the other day, I had a client call me. She had a um, mentally ill person following her, screaming at her she felt the need that he uh, he was following her again we don't know the full extent of if it's drug related or mental illness related but nonetheless you have to treat it that your yourself is going home at the end of the night much like we like to say at the end of roll call that our goal at the end of the night is for everybody to go home safely whether that be me my partner my supervisors or anybody in the community that we interact with so for being out and about, whether you're taking your dog out for the walk, you're walking with the kids, um, just be aware of your surroundings. That's probably first and foremost. I know we live in a day and age where we've got our phones, I um, mean, you know, we're constantly on our phones. We've got the AirPods tucked in, whether we're, you know, jamming out to our music, just enjoying the peace and, you know, in our zone or whatever, and getting a little bit of exercise. But it's always one of those, just be cautious of your surroundings. Um, it's much like traffic accidents. A majority of traffic accidents happen closest to home when you think nothing will happen to me. I'm five minutes away from home. And that's when you drop your guard down. Um, that's one of those things that you just have to watch and be careful of. And it's not to give anybody a sense of like paranoia where it's like I have to, you know, constantly keep my head on a swivel, but definitely keep an eye out. Um, everybody that's been long term residents, you know, you know, living at your house, you know, whose cars are whose. You know, you've come to find out like, oh, hey, uh, you know, Mr. Smith's daughter got a new vehicle. She comes over every you know, Wednesday, Thursdays, whatever it may be. Um, we get calls like that on a regular basis. They're like, hey, this guy looks a little shady. I don't know, you know, who he is. The car doesn't look familiar to me. Can you guys just, you know, cruise on by and check it out? And it's one of those where I've done it plenty of times in a patrol car. Um, on the job. And then even with SSA, as you go by and you drive by, you go around the block once and then lo and behold, the car is gone because sometimes just the presence alone will deter them. And people like to think that, you know, criminals are not the smartest of the bunch, but when it really comes to it, they pick up on certain things like that. If you're looking at them, if you give them a second look, um, instead of just walking by them and not paying any attention to them on your phone, they kind of get like, ooh, this is a hot area. They kind of know what's up and, you know, keep an eye out for everybody. So they kind of skedaddle and take the hint realistically. Um, so that just goes into your personal, your personal space and your protection um, leading into like people and vehicles, protecting your vehicle. Um, it's one of those things that we're, we, are, we all do it. We're guilty of it. I leave phone cords out. I get away. I leave my iPad on the, on the driver's seat some nights. Um, sometimes you come home from work or you're out at a family event and you're just exhausted and you think, forget about it. It's fine till tomorrow morning. And it's one of those things where, yeah, it's fine nine out of 10 times, but it's always that 10th time that's going to get you. Um, make sure your cars are locked. 
again, you you think you lock it. And I know the newer cars in this day and age have auto lock features and everything else like that. At the end of the day, it's still technology. They're still prone to failing. Um, so unless you, you know, physically beep it right there with your key or you do it on your door and you see the little pin or the red dot come on in your car to make sure it's locked, just one of those things, um, you know, be leery about even, I mean, I've done it multiple times too, where I go to bed, I'm like, did I lock the car? And I think it'll be okay, but I still get up and go and do it just because I have that peace of mind um, going to bed. And going into that, like the burglaries from the vehicles, the iPads, um, they're anything that looks of any value. It doesn't even matter if it's a $5 charging cable from 7-Eleven. If it remotely resembles anything that may be connected to something valuable, it gives the people a little hope that they think, oh, it's probably tucked in the seat. It's maybe underneath the seat. Um, you've seen, I've seen other things from just books and random clothes that we're going to go for donations to full on briefcases with, you know, the husband's work computer, his tablet, his accounting info and all his login info, thinking that, oh, I didn't want to forget it in the morning going to work in a rush. Um, Garage remotes, I know a lot of them are programmed in the cars. You don't really see too much of that. Again, this is, you're going to go into like the different tiers of like serious criminals that are watching your house. And it's, it's a lot of work instead of somebody that just comes by and think, oh, I can make this a quick snag and then leave. So with that, your car, just make sure it's locked. You keep your valuables out of it. Um, I get on my girlfriend on a regular basis. She leaves her purse in the front seat. I'm like, where's your purse? She's like, it's in the front seat. I go get it because, and she's like, there's nothing valuable in there. I have my wallet. All that's in there is, you know, a tube of chapstick, a brush and, uh, her little pocket mirror with some makeup. And I'm like, it doesn't matter because you're going to be ending up paying for a windshield or for a window and then the headache of it and everything else. Um, it's just trying to make your life easier at the end of the day, because uh, I was a officer up north for a little bit and San Francisco was getting hit like there was no tomorrow. Um, anything that resembled it, sunglasses, hats, um, you name it, they were tempted to break into it to see if there was anything. Uh, strollers, baby bags. And it's just there's no rhyme or reason to it. And if you know, law enforcement could figure it out, then we'd probably be able to stop it somehow. And then going into furthermore into your house, um, your garages. I grew up in a time, I'm only 29. Um, so I grew up in a time in a neighborhood where everybody left their garages open, the front doors were left open, and we all came and go out of each other's houses like everybody was a family member. Um, those times have very much changed. It's one of those where criminals have gotten more brazen that, I mean, they're, you get more and more stories, whether it be on the news, the neighborhood app, wherever you get your information for your neighborhood, is that these guys are getting just right in the middle of the day. Um, doesn't matter. Um, I had a, an attempted burglary at 10 o'clock in the morning while the wife was in the back pool house and the husband was upstairs getting ready to leave to go to his run. And they just middle of the day, um, you'll see it. If you see one, there's probably one or two more because they like to work in pairs or even quads because you've got a lookout, you've got a driver and you've got one or two that will actually go in to commit it. And then that's your getaway. So for your house, um, keep your doors locked, keep your windows locked. If you're not home, um, you know, you don't have to be best friends with your neighbors. But at least, you know, keep an eye out for your neighbors. Uh, I know, you know, who my neighbors have over. I know that they've got kids in college. So if there's a bunch of 18 and 19 year olds showing up in the cul-de-sac, um, more than likely, they're all going over to the house there that they're having a little barbecue at. Um, and then there's been other times where at two o'clock in the morning, you see a car that comes in the cul-de-sac and it circles two or three times. And you're like, that doesn't seem right. Um, just weird behavior that it, it, it's not, not everybody has it right away, but as far as, you know, you just see, and you're like, I've never seen that before. Just give it a double look. 
um, doesn't hurt. And then you, lo and behold, you find out that it's somebody's aunt that hasn't been visited in 20 years and they came out. Um, your doors, your windows, if you're not gonna be home, close your blinds in the front, anywhere that may have access to have visibility inside to your home. Um, it's one of those where they're gonna come up and just look through your window, see what you have out. Uh, you see a majority of these, I've seen burglaries happen and they've completely just not even looked at the expensive wall art that was on the wall. And they went into the bedrooms looking for jewelry and struck out. They just ransacked it and they'll be like, oh, they took my, uh, you know, my Apple, my iPhone 8 that I just had as a paperweight. And it's, uh, you can have an alarm system. That's one of the biggest deterrents is that you have it notified. And sometimes they're a pain, but other times they're, you know, a savior. Darlene Downwell, uh, join the meeting. You don't know. I get them all the time where as SSA, we're, we're a partner with the, like all the alarm companies and we're notified about alarms and some clients either make us the first or the second contact of it. And with that, we start heading that way to respond to it. And we'll either get a cancellation notice that somebody was contacted and they gave us the correct pin or they call us and the client's like, Hey, nobody should be at my home. I'm away at work. So we go over there and more times than not, it's been the maid or the dog sitter or anything else like that. But it's just to have that extra peace of mind that, hey, why is it going off? And much like any piece of technology, there are times where it goes off for no particular reason, especially in the Wilshire area. When it's windy, we'll get false alarms left, right and center because the branches hit the windows and it'll trigger a, a glass break. And it's a big nothing. But I like to tell everybody that I rather come out to a big nothing and have absolutely nothing going on than to have somebody be like, oh, no, don't worry about it. And, you know, cancel me. And lo and behold, they come home in a couple hours and something did happen. Um, peace of mind. That's what we're here for. You know, you, whether you're 20 minutes away at the supermarket or you're three hours up north visiting family or whatever it is. You, you know, if you were to have SSA, you can call us, we can go over there. Um, the housing stuff also comes in lines with cameras. I know a majority of people have Nest. That's how a lot of our clients from personal experience and police now can use it to identify people, um, even to just get an eye on your house. I've seen some houses that have just the Nest camera in the front of the doorbell, and I've seen houses that have got cameras on every inch of the property and they show me on their phone and they can see everything that's happening in real time. Um, it's whatever your preference is, whatever you like to know, like to have. It's, um, I like to encourage people with uh, floodlights, the motion sensor lights. That's a big deterrent too, because obviously if there's lights coming on, you're drawn to it, your neighbors are drawn to it. If you do have animals, especially dogs, they're drawn to it, they hear things, way sooner than you will. And uh, I like to tell people too, I'm like, if you want the best security system, get yourself a dog if you're willing and able and you know want to go that route with the security purpose. Um, I've got two pit bulls and a shepherd. And if that door knocks, I don't think anybody's going to come into my house. So those are just some of the, just some of the tips and tricks. Um, to help keep you guys safe, keep you guys alert. Um, again, I'm not saying you have to go out and buy the most whiz bang security features and you know make your house look like you're going into the castle for the queen, but just little things here and there. Um, they do have some of their affordable things. And uh, I know, I think some of them, they do like have some secure networks or even like that. I haven't seen it's technology again. Some ring cameras don't pick up everything, but a little piece of something is better than nothing. Because if you just say, hey, somebody broke in and I don't know what he was or what he looked like or anything. And even if your ring camera catches a glimpse of him wearing, you know, a purple T-shirt with the Lakers logo on it and black pants, it's something and it's better than nothing to go off of because maybe down the road it'll be connected to something else. And there's other victims with the same guy that's the same description. 
And uh, those are the type of guys that you seem to catch more often than not. Okay. Excellent, excellent. Um, sorry, I do actually have Officer Green on the phone. So thank you so much, Officer Liddy. That is very, very helpful. I did I do have Officer Green on the phone. He's having a hard time logging in. It's the security between the LEPD and my little computer or link. So, but we do have him and um, he will talk in just a minute. Um, I just wanted to interrupt here to uh, before we hear about the crime stats and more tips. Um, uh, Officer Liddy is absolutely correct. And so I want you to think back to what our Neighborhood Watch program is. If you're new, this is all new to you and you're not familiar with the Miracle Mile Neighborhood Watch program, it is doing exactly what Officer Liddy said. We are, con it's not what you think. We don't put on a vest and we're patrolling the area. This is not vigilantism. This is a group of neighbors working together with block organization and as a neighborhood. I want to give you four stories real quick, and this will really help out, especially after you hear the crime statistics from Officer Green and having heard, and now you're sort of primed for, okay, now I didn't think about that. Some of you might be installing cameras or do things to really harden your target um, and make your, your home safer. Um, but Neighborhood Watch is the most important thing because it's education. It's learning how to secure your property, your home, your car, but it's working together as neighbors. So let me give you four stories so that you'll understand how successful and why we're so successful in Miracle Mile so far. Yes, we still have crime. Obviously, I can't report to you. We have absolutely no break-ins because you all followed our three-step neighborhood watch. You all became block captains, so there's no crime. We wouldn't have this meeting tonight, but we are successful and we are supported by secure patrol companies, LAPD, and here are the stories. So there's a few things. We had four incidents. First of all, all of the incidents that occurred on Ridgely, the 1,000 block, what happened there was those incidents happen. What usually happens is people don't report or talk about them. If we're lucky, they're filing a report with LAPD, but oftentimes they don't. But that particular block has a very active block captain, and she has reached out to those neighbors. She communicates with them by email. I believe they have their group text set up. And when something happens, they notify their block captain. So Jennifer was able to do that and notified me. And I was able to realize, wow, this is coming in and I'm going to compare it to the other statistics and news that I'm hearing about on Cloverdale and Cochrane. And um, that leads us to have this meeting. It also leads us to activate a system. So what we have is communication on your particular block among your neighbors. You have a group text alert where you can say, hey, somebody just broke uh, Joe's window or ran down Amy's uh, to the back of her house, and that's not a person that belongs there, and you activate the system. Secondly, the block captains communicate to me, the neighborhood watch coordinator, who basically has LAPD on uh, like Batman's red phone or whatever. And that's something that you definitely want to have. We also have patrol companies. We have uh, ACS and ADT. And now we have SSA as an option in the neighborhood as well. But the point is, is that you have options. You activate the system, you communicate. So that's what happened on Ridgely. The second story is um, the other, yesterday, there was a block captain driving down 9th, heading westbound. She looked over and saw a guy on a bike, and he was trying to get into the gate of a neighbor. She recognized that that person didn't belong there because she knew the residents who lived there. She dropped his bike. He was trying to get in and um, trespass get into their gate when a dog walker came by. And that dog walker made the bicycle, the guy get back on his bike and pedal off. The block captain took photos, reported it to me. We put it on our band app, which is a text communication just for block captains. You can say, hey, I saw this and this is going on. And then I was able to reach out to the block captain who actually she saw it on the on the text app. She notified the neighbors and said, oh, my goodness, we had no idea. We were wondering why the dog was barking and going crazy. And she was able to get those photos and that information and block neighborhood wide. You guys were notified, basically, of what had happened. That's if you have a block captain, if you are roped into these ways of communicating, you would have known. That's how we're going to fight crime in Miracle Mile with LAPD, patrol companies, and communication. And that means a lot. Next story, and I'm almost done, but this is why. This is why the system works. This wasn't just created out of fear or panic and everybody needs to run on. You do need to do your part, and your part is being active with your block. Because once you do that, 
we've got the whole system in place for you. Um, the next story is um, there was a transient walking along, I believe, Cochran Tau, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was Cloverdale. She was walking her dog near Wilshire when she saw a transient and she didn't want to walk across the street to make a big deal of it. She was very, you know, understanding and, and compassionate and didn't want to make a, uh, any, uh, didn't want him to feel uncomfortable. Well, as she walked past him, he whacked her in the head and knocked her to the ground. What happened there was the block captain who's in that area notified me that put it on alert along with information in his photo. And that particular block captain, Tao, if I can call you out, she started Paw Patrol so that those people who are in on her group text for Paw Patrol can feel comfortable walking in that area and kind of have a lookout for each other. This guy has been known to be undressed, harassing Starbucks. It's been an ongoing problem. People, these people are concerned when they see him knowing that he has this behavior. And obviously it was reported to LAPD, et cetera. That's the value of having an active neighborhood watch. That's what I want you to understand tonight. That's why it is so important that you get involved with your block. You can lock your own home, take care of your own car. But if you don't come into this neighborhood and have an active block and communicate then you've really lost one of the most important ways to protect your car, yourself, and your home. The last story happened here on Dunsmuir, and that was when there was a uh, person who was experiencing some uh, mental challenges, shall I say, and was an obvious transient, and he decided to sit on my front lawn in my Adirondack chair. I could tell he was um, needing assistance. At the same time, he decided to try to break into my home by going to my gates and checking on them. And he looked like he wanted to get in. Thankfully, he didn't climb over. I called LAPD first. And my second call was to ADT patrol. ADT showed up in 14 minutes. And sorry, Officer Green, that you're listening. But it, it took, uh, I never heard back from LAPD to tell you the truth. And I gave a full description and everything and explained that he was trying to breach my fence and get in. At, ADT came out and was able to um, inquire why he was taking a nap on my neighbor's porch at this time and asked him to leave. He took his shoes out of my tree and he started to walk away when he did a 180 and tore down southbound on Dunsmuir and ran off. ADT went after to see if they could find him. They were looking for him. They couldn't. About 40 minutes later, I see, um, no, excuse me. It was about an hour and a half later, I see police cars coming down the street, flying down the street. What had happened was that same transient had gone into my neighbor's house who had left their door unlocked. They had gone into the home and another neighbor witnessed that, notified the neighbor who got out of their house, called LAPD. Sorry for this, Officer Green. It took him an hour and 15 minutes for LAPD to show up. Once they did, the man had barricaded himself in that home and it took seven uh, basic car units, one mental health unit and an overhead aerial support and 45 to 60 minutes of negotiating with him before he was arrested. And that story tells you the value of having, um, uh, securing your property, having adequate uh, everything from cameras to door locks and being part of your active neighborhood watch. What did happen were there were neighbors alerted to my situation. And I even had a neighbor across the street saw that I had texted on the group chat just for my block. And I said, there was someone on front. I called ADT. I called LAPD. They even had eyes on my home and said, we're watching right now until 14 minutes later when ADT came. So those are the examples I wanted to share with you. So you understand the value of being an active neighborhood watch. And everything that Officer Liddy has shared with you and what Officer Green will share with you as tips as well, in conjunction with the three-step neighborhood watch program that we have designed that is in the links. When you click on the links in the chat, I encourage you all to highlight and copy and click those links to somewhere links on your computer. Uh, you will have access to the resources. We have uh, a way to start a block captain system on your block. If you don't have a block captain, if you want to be a block captain, please let us know. If you want to know about the three steps to neighborhood watch um, and how to be an active um, neighborhood watch participant, um, that is hugely successful. Every block that does it 
likes it. They feel safer. They understand the value of it and how it works. And with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Officer Green. Let me unmute you. Welcome, Officer Green. This is Officer Adam Green, who is covering for Officer Anna Shuby, who is our Miracle Mile Senior Lead Officer. Your Senior Lead Officers are, are you on? I see you right there. Should I hang up on you? Oh, yay. All right. Welcome, Officer Green. Thank you so much. Um, I'm glad that you can hack through the LAPD security system. I won't tell anybody, I promise. So, Officer Green, why don't you give us the crime stats and take it from there? You have heard everything we said so far. So, fill in the blanks and correct me where I went wrong. He's connecting to audio, so let's give him one second. <laughs> He's almost there. He's almost there. And then after this, we're going to, I know you have a lot of questions in the chat and um, please put more questions in there if you have them. Uh, my moderator will help me address those and we'll get to all your questions after this. All right, Adam, take it away. Can you take it away? <laughs> okay, he's still having an issue. If so, we'll put him back on the phone, but we'll give him just a minute to connect to audio. So I hope this is helpful for you thus far. I really hope you're on. Okay. All right. How about now? You guys can hear me? Okay, cool. Never give up. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you guys. I've been working on this since a quarter to seven, but I'm here. So just let me know when you want me to chime in. Yeah, so chime in right now. Sorry, you missed it. Um, chime in right now. I gave, so off, uh, we have SSA Officer Brian Liddy, and he's given him um, the security tips on how to secure their car, home, and self. Um, I've get some, given some anecdotal stories to support the Neighborhood Watch program. And we're interested, I think everyone here is interested in knowing exactly what's going on with crime in Miracle Mile. And we're looking for your additional tips and support of the Neighborhood Watch program that we've implemented. Got it. With that being said, I missed my introduction, so I will introduce myself. My name is Adam Green. I am a senior lead officer out of Wilshire Station. And basically, the area that I cover, it's just going to be just a little bit south of uh, senior lead officer Anna Shuby, which is a community that you guys live in. Uh, what I normally do at some of my meetings, I definitely speak on crimes that are documented, and I give you the information that we have that actual victims uh, file reports where it is considered actual crimes that are documented. A lot of times in some of my meetings, um, the conversation goes on things that happen within the community, but these are things that are not documented. So it's very hard for me to actually talk about those things if it's not documented. So with that being said, what I went ahead and did is I went, and went back about total of three weeks, definitely wanted to get a start of this month and talk about the crimes that occur within this month. And the way I do this, I talk about within a seven day period. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start this out by starting with September the 25th of this year to October the 1st of this year, which is a seven day period. Well, within a seven day period, we had a total of seven crimes that were re recorded. Now, when I say recorded, I'm not talking about the whole area that Anna Shuby covers. I'm only gonna talk about the real estate with you guys basically live within. And the boundaries that I'm gonna cover is gonna be La Brea to the east, Fairfax to the west, San Vicente to the south, and Wilshire to the north. Within that seven day period, once again, September the 25th of this year, all the way up to October the 1st, like I mentioned, we had a total of seven crimes reported. Um, crime to me is crime, but the good thing uh, that the cut type of crimes that were recorded within that seven day period were basically property crimes. And I'm just gonna go through them real quick because I got two other pages I'm gonna cover. Uh, we had one robbery that was reported. Now that robbery, that sounds very, very um, uh, uh, scary, but in this robbery in itself was basically a domestic violence incident only so both parties knew each other. So I guess within a domestic violence incident, property was taken by one party did not belong to the other by force. So that was a robbery that was recorded. I have one reported burglary that happened on uh, Fairfax. Uh, we had three burglary from motor vehicles uh, that were reported. We had one theft and two vehicles were stolen. 
when I was actually going through these reports of the type of burglary for motor vehicles, it, it seems that your community was being uh, bombarded with Cadillac converter thefts. So that was the type of burglary for motor vehicle reports that were taken within that period. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to October the 2nd, all the way to October the 8th. During that period, we had a total of crime reports, a uh, uh, total of 10 crime reports that were reported within that, that boundary that I mentioned earlier. Once again, La Brea to the east, Fairfax to the west, San Vicente to the south, Wilshire to the north. Within that period, that seven day period, we had one robbery. Now that robbery was a stranger robbery. And basically when I say a stranger robbery, where force was used, our victim was entering a bus on Wilshire. As the victim was entering a bus, the suspect accessed the bus, took the victim's pro property with force, no injury to the victim, got off the bus with the victim's property and fled the location. Um, we had four burglary for motor vehicles. There again, we had some vehicles that were broken into due to the, the suspects entering the vehicles and unknown means. And, and what that means sometimes, uh, unfortunately, I hate to say this, sometimes we do leave our vehicles unlocked or we leave a window cracked or, or sometimes these guys come up with these devices where they actually can access your car. So when it says un unknown means, there's many different ways where a person may have gotten to your vehicle, where we as officers that come out and do that investigation, it is hard for us to determine how the vehicle was actually breached. But with that still being said, I also had a few vehicles that had the Cadillac converters taken during that period. And we also had three cars that were stolen. Going to the most recent weeks, which is gonna be from October the 9th, all the way up to this past Saturday, which is gonna be October the 15th, we only had a total of four crimes that were reported within that boundary that I, I mentioned. And the crimes that were reported during that time was one burglary for motor vehicle, one theft, and two vehicles that were stolen. And that's basically the most recent crime update that I can give within a three day, three week period that brings us all the way from October the 1st, all the way up until uh, Saturday the 15th. Any questions? Uh, before we go to questions, um, I think the concern that some people are having is uh, two things I'm gonna, um, start off with is I think the response time from LAPD, um, I think it's a concern um, for most residents. I think it's a concern for LAPD. We only have 9,200 sworn officers. We honestly need 12,000. But can you give us a little more insight to that and also how uh, some neighbors are feeling that crimes aren't going reported? So what you just read to us would not really include the burglary of a home where it was completely um, crashed and all items were stolen. So that, that, in fact, that doesn't reflect the um, crimes because you said it was from the 9th through the 15th, right? Exactly. So the burglary that occurred that you're talking about where the whole home was was thrashed, where, was, where did this happen? The uh, thousand block of Ridgely. And when did it happen, if you know? Around what, what period? Was it I, before the dates that I gave? I'm just trying to figure out. I don't think so. It would have had to have been in the past two weeks, I believe. Well, now, if it's within that boundary, I would have that if it was actually reported. And like I mentioned, that very first week, we had one burglary that actually occurred and it was reported. And I think that was one off of Fairfax, if not Olympic, if it bordered Olympic or Fairfax. But that was the only burglary that I had within that area. And let's take a look again. Yeah, that's it. Okay. So I'm uh, not sure exactly, you said 100 block of what again? I'm sorry. It was the 100, oh, excuse me, the 1000 block of uh, Ridgely. And it also looks like there is confirmation there was uh, one on Cloverdale. Yeah, uh, not, not within, uh, the information that I have that I read off within those boundaries, don't see them. Okay, so we'll try to verify that. Can you okay. maybe give us quick insight as to uh, uh, how people are to report? Online reporting, do they need to go to the station? Should they just forget about it and not? Why is reporting important? Can you Got touch it. on that before we go to questions? Got it. Uh, first of all, not reporting is it's a terrible thing to do. Why? Because the more reports that we have, 
in one particular area, especially if it turns out it is a cluster. The way our department, our division will put their resources basically, unfortunately, where the crime is occurring. If these crimes are going unreported, well, the resources are gonna be in a high impacted area where crime is actually occurring and reported. And reported. So therefore, any crime that occur, or you're a victim of a crime, it is very important to report. Now, unfortunately, yes, the wait time is terrible. I would even say the non-emergency line is terrible. I can, I can actually vouch for that. Um, there are several reasons why it is that way. Um, I, I don't want to talk about the negative reasons why it is that way, but there are several reasons why the response time is terrible and the wait for officers and your calls to go through are, are just, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. But with that also being said, if in fact, by knowing that the response time is terrible, all depends on what type of report or what type of victim that you are, a lot of these reports can actually now be, be reported online. Uh, the way you do that is you can just go to uh, LAPD and then our, our LAPD website, and then there's going to be a series of things or, or, or locations or, or apps, or not apps, but click ones that you can actually look up and click on where you would see something that would read online reporting. Well, once you click on that, it's going to give you different type of reports that you can actually follow online. Keep in mind, you cannot file all reports online, but there are several different reports that can be reported online versus going to the station or calling the police and have us come on out. As a matter of fact, some of those reports where you can actually do it online, if in fact you do get a, to the operator, the operator may, the dispatcher may even tell you, hey, uh, the call load may be a little bit late. You can actually file this type of report online. So it's still up to you. But, you know, with our call load and lack of resources, I would think the online reporting is the way to go today. Excellent. Okay, so um, I want to make sure everyone's engaging again. This is a great opportunity for you to put some questions in the chat, and then we're going to try to get questions answered um, with raised hands. I see a few already, but I, um, I'm going to start with the questions that were posted in the chat. So let me scroll down. So the first question um, from Douglas Hart was, how do we know who our block captain is? And when you click on the link for the resources, It'll take you to the MMRA website, which you will be able to go to Neighborhood Watch, and there's a list of block captains there. So basically, every resource is under Neighborhood Watch tab on the MMRA website. Um, and if you don't have a block captain, um, let me know. And my email is in the chat as well. And let's see, we have... Um, Okay, someone saw someone on the bike. So some more neighborhood watch going on in the chat, actually. Um, Liz Hart says she's concerned about drug dealers around South Orange Grove and dealing to patients at the Wilshire Vista Manor. Can you address that, either Officer Liddy or Officer Green? I can address that. Oh, does Liddy want to speak? Can I Whatever. talk to? Can I speak? Yes, Liz, did you want to chime in on your question there? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Officer Green and um, and Brian, you know, so yes, I'm very concerned. There's been drug dealing happening. I, I live just literally a click away from Wilshire Manor. And I've seen uh, specifically one person dealing out of his van. And I found out, well, he's doing a service to the patients at Wilshire Manor because he's selling them pot. So he's, he thinks it's doing them a service. Um, however, there's somebody else on the street. I've called the police before. You all, I love you. I support PD, everything. Um, but I've called several times because the paramedics in the fire department are here every other, literally every other day. So I, and I don't know, the, the paramedics can't talk about it because of HIPAA, uh, but it, there's, there's stuff going on there. The patients walk out, they go to the van, you know, I, I see it happening all the time. And um, so that's one concern. The other concern is the mail theft in this neighborhood, not only with my building, 
I live in a building. We have uh, 16 units. Uh, I saw it happen across the street. I was up at 4.30 in the morning. I saw two guys walk across the street. They went into the building, opened up the box, took the mail. Uh, but I, I witnessed it here two times. First time I called PD and they showed up at 4.30. Second time I called PD, they did not. They said it's a federal crime. So we can't do anything. Right. And so, you know, uh, again, it's up to the landlords or whomever. But that crime is happening. And I'm concerned because all of the new uh, rebates, stimulus checks, whatever, are starting to go out, right? So everybody's a sucker right now. And our former mail person said, yeah, we've had it happening around the neighborhood. So what's going on with that? Got it. Let's take let's take the first one, which is narcotics. First and why of can't all why can't I call 311? Okay, let me let me let me address your narcotic complaint first. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. First of Thank all, by dialing the non-emergency line for an ongoing problem such as narcotic activity, yeah, you're not going to get the right resources there. I'll tell you why. Anytime a, a person is out there selling and dealing on the street, and a con, uh, community member sees what's going on, call the non-emergency line. That black and white come cruising down that street. That person is going to see this. That person is going to see that black and white stick out like a sore thumb. Hold on, let me finish, please. I let you speak, let me finish before you start waving your hands. So bottom line is you're, 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 you're speaking to the wrong resources. What you're complaining about is basically something that should be directed to the senior lead officer. Yes, Anna Shuby has been out. I am stepping in her place just to assist with this meeting. But what I'm gonna do is provide you and whoever else is in this, this meeting with the right number where you can actually call and be anonymous, leave that information. The information that you're going to be speaking to or leaving that information to is going to be Wilshire Narcotic Unit. These people dress in plain clothes. As a matter of fact, if you were to see them drive up, you wouldn't even know that they're police officers or detectives. So I will provide that number for you. So therefore, you no longer have to contact the non-emergency line or call Wilshire Station because your call is definitely not going to be handled the right way. So I will provide that number for you when you're ready. And then I'll talk about the mail theft. Let, you ready? Wilshire Narcotics phone number is going to be area code 213-949-0847. That's going to be Detective Kylie's city cell phone number. They carry that phone with them. If they're out actually in operation and it rings, go ahead and please leave a voicemail. They're good at getting back, especially about an ongoing problem such as that they will address it, okay? Definitely leave a contact number so therefore they can call you back, all right? Now let's talk about mail theft. Yeah, it is a federal crime. Unfortunately, uh, we can't handle everybody's investigations. So therefore it will be ideal if we have the amount of resources that can do these kind of radio calls, get there in the amount of time and address these issues. It's just not gonna happen. I'm being honest and being realistic with you. So the best thing that I would do, you can contact the U.S. Post Office, let them know of this ongoing theft at this particular location, what these suspects look like, because who knows, they may be doing their own investigation right now at this particular location, because I guarantee, even if we were to respond, we would not be conducting an investigation on federal crimes such as mail theft. Excellent. Thank you so much for those answers, Officer Green. And there is confirmation coming in the chat that the crimes that I was mentioning occurred prior to those dates and were reported and had an LAPD response. So thank you for okay, that. Perfect. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. Next question we have in the chat comes from Kevin Glenn, who would like to know why the LAPD or police are not going after those crime hotspots right under their nose, such as those encampments, actively stealing bicycles and now motorbikes and disassembling them, selling them. La Cienega and Venice on Sunday mornings is now a thieves market of stolen goods. What is preventing, though I can imagine political considerations, the police from breaking up criminal operations on our street? Good question. Good question. First of all, think about it. If any of you guys out there have a bike, did you document the serial number to that bike? I would say this, 99% of the time, 
a lot of people does not have a serial number documented on their bike. So when it turns out that their bike is stolen, that are sometimes not even reported, and people, yes, we, we would, I would agree with you, how are these people getting these bikes? Think about it. So I, I hate to say this, yes, I would say they do steal bikes. Why and I would say this is because I have seen videotape of an unhoused person going into someone's property, taking their bike. But if in fact we do come across a situation where these people are working on bikes, setting up bike chop shops, and there's no identifying it, uh, things on that bike to identify that, yes, this bike was reported stolen, which is kind of difficult to do today, then therefore we have no crime. We cannot say without a doubt that this bike is stolen or these are stolen bike parts without it being identified as a stolen bike part. Keep in mind, yes, we can go in and, as, and, and kick in doors, kick in encampments, take everybody to jail, book the bike parts as evidence, but guess what? Without anything indicating that these things are uh, items that are stolen, it's a waste of your city taxes and it's gonna be a waste of our resources going in there trying to file charges where these far charges would not be filed with the city attorney's office or district attorney's office. Why? Because we have nothing to support what is being alleged there. Now, yes, if we have a victim of a, a crime and he follows that person to that person's encampment, identifies that person's, his property, identify the person who took his thing, then yes, hands down, without a doubt, that citizen, citizen can do a private person's arrest right there on the spot for the theft or whatever crime that he was a victim of, and that person can go to jail as far as him making that arrest. But you got to understand, uh, 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 people are really just going a little bit, uh, I mean, in a different direction with this homeless thing. And I, I say this, we're not the only resources or entity that addresses homeless problem. We are now being bombarded to do enforcement on 41.18 LAMC sections. Why? Because a lot of other res resources are just not out there to assess or to assist addressing this homeless problem. It is now enforcement, 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 enforcement. And I really think it's unfair because there's resources out there should be assisting these people on getting off the street. But since we're the one who answers the call, we're the ones who show up. Then when you still see the problem still exists, we're the one who's getting kicked to the curb because they're still there. This is not just a police matter. We will arrest anybody who's committing a crime. They don't have to be unhoused, you understand? It's just that when it comes to the homeless, we are now taking a brunt of this because other city resources are not out there assisting us with this problem. So it's more than just the crimes that you see these people are doing. So you're inviting a vigilante situation where if you find that in neighborhoods where you have active hotspots of encampments and these encampments are growing and they're growing by the active thievery and pillaging of the neighborhoods and you are the 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 police are passive aggressive and the neighborhoods are being victimized. And whether it's the police or the business, I mean, you, let's say for instance, shopping carts. Shopping carts are, uh, they're, they're transportation vehicles for stolen goods and they're just being, you know, agglomerated in these very, very, you know, hotspots. I've seen the one hotspot on Hauser heading towards, uh, heading towards Sixth Street. It disappeared, now it's growing again. Do they? you know, they, they grow and you're, you're inviting the neighborhoods to be sort of like the, the police are passive aggressive. And at, at a certain point, you're going to find neighborhoods who might actively try to enforce the law on their own. Okay. So let me just clear something up. We're not being passive aggressive aggressive. If you heard what I just said a moment ago, this is not just a police matter, you understand? Someone who's out there holding a gun to a person's head that's robbing them at gunpoint or taking their jewelry or their property, we're gonna act on that. We're not being passive aggressive. But if you got someone who's setting up an encampment, we should not be the first persons that are being called. It should be your councilman's office, it should be sanitation, it should be homeless outreach services, it should be all these under, other entities within the city that can assist us in addressing this problem. Even if we do go to an encampment and arrest that person for theft 
or arrest that person for whatever crime he has committed, where do you think he's going to return to? That encampment. Or he'll set up another encampment around the corner. So what I'm saying is this is something we cannot arrest our, our, ourselves out of. Everybody is making it seem as if we can. If that's the case, if you go back and look at the summer of 2020, it was more than what they were talking about, Black Lives Matter and all that good stuff. It was more about the resources that are being used in situations where police should not be involved. People are failing to forget that. Now it's starting to hit their back door. Those same people that were out there chatting that stuff, they now want us to act. So like I said before, if before you say something like that, try reaching out to some of these other city entities that would, can they help address these problem with these people living on the street? And on that note, Officer Green, I wanna interject just for a second that we do have resources and they are listed when you click on the link um, for outreach to homeless. And this is true. We do need to utilize the resources that are out there. This is not gonna be a problem that is solved overnight. Kevin, you bring up good points, but I would like to definitely take the uh, advice of Officer Green here. There are other resources. In fact, there is even a new mental health number, 988, for those experiencing a mental emergency, a mental crisis. Uh, anything that is an emergency that is a crime in progress or a threat to life and limb is a 911 call. Less than that, you have an option for a non-emergency. A mental health crisis, somebody in distress, you need to call 988. That is a new number that is improving every day with resources so they can answer that call. We also are encouraging you to, when you see a homeless person, an unhoused individual, to use the uh, www.la-hop.org website. Again, it's all in the links. All these resources on our, the, are on our website. And um, you need to, uh, they don't know where everyone is. And I have done a great job of doing over 15 requests with LA Hop. We need to put the pressure on. When we know where they are, we can get the resources to them and we can minimize and mitigate a lot of issues and fallout from this disaster in our city. And it is very sad. And I would also like to know that when there is a humanitarian crisis, there are options also to provide water for those who need it when we are having severe heat weather conditions. So please consider all aspects to the problem that we're all working towards. But for tonight's purpose of protecting yourself and others, please do use things like the LA Hop website. Please reach out to those resources. There are things out there for you. I hear what you're saying, Kevin. And moving forward, I do want to thank LAPD for what you are doing with limited resources and trying to get to the 911 call down the street when there is a person barricaded in my neighbor's home. So hats off to LAPD, hats off to our security patrol companies that are augmenting and filling that gap. And mostly thank you again to our block captains and those of you tonight who have a block captain and have a text alert system, I think you're doing a fantastic job. Moving forward, I would like to address the question that was a good one brought up regarding a Wi-Fi jammer. It was, um, there was a robbery on Cloverdale and they're pretty certain that the thieves had a Wi-Fi jammer. And I think Brian, um, Officer Liddy, you uh, were beginning to answer that. Can you follow up on that one, Officer Liddy? You had a good answer there. Did I lose Officer Liddy, perhaps? No, nope, you're there. Hi, Brian. Oh, okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. So just to piggyback off the response in the group chat there, I'm not by any means the most tech savvy person out there. Um, like Officer Green was saying that the technology is ever growing and much like these stolen cars, some of these guys have jammers. There are people out there that can literally sit across the street or even down the street with a remote no bigger than a cell phone and they can pick a car signal they can pick your garage signal and yes it's very scary and that why are people like that in the world but that's where it comes into being diligent with it and everything else now back to me not being so tech savvy maybe officer green has had a little more experience with these types of things is that there are ways to make secure networks and have password protected encryptors for your routers and things like that, other than just your, you know, your standard AT&T uh, modem that you have up in your, you know, your uh, broom closet that, you know, sends Wi-Fi to the whole house. Um, again, I've experienced it multiple and multiple times on burglaries and, you know, attempted burglaries that, like I said earlier, when we were talking that it's technology, it's going to fail as much as we have it high tech in this day and age. There are ring cameras that 
won't pick up the mailman coming and the mailman is standing there shoveling a pound of mail into your mailbox and leaves you your nice your nice ups package or anything else like that and the ring camera just won't catch it flat out and it doesn't have to be a jammer it doesn't have to be anything I'm sure everyone can attest to the fact that you can walk in any corner of your house or just for whatever reason, one day you're on the couch or you're trying to stream Netflix. And for whatever reason, it just doesn't want to load. And then you're frustrated and everything else that comes with it when you're trying to relax on a day off or a night in with the wife or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, whoever it may be. Um, so, yes, those things are out there. And in my past experience through private security and law enforcement, that stuff is really kind of getting up there that you're getting these super experienced guys that are going to go to the extent of using these jammers, using all these, these tech savvy, these big whiz things, because even though we have those things, you're still going to resort to the quick coat hanger or a lock pick, you know, punch out the, uh, the key or anything else or smash a window because you're not going to sit there fiddling with anything else, trying to make it work when I can just smash a window in 10 seconds, yank out whatever I see in there, and I'm gone within 30 seconds to a minute, um, you know, before anybody gets out of bed within that minute to be like, what was that? Why is the car alarm going off? It can happen that quick. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Liddy, for that answer. We're going to get to you, David, in just one second. And on that note, I do want to take this opportunity to remind everybody to lock your utility box. Um, there, It has been known to happen in the past that uh, power has been turned off to a home. And either way, whether it's emergency preparedness, which um, is something we're all going to be working more on in Miracle Mile, but even if your power is cut is to have your, if you do have hardwired uh, cameras is to have them backed up with a universal power source so that when, which has been known to happen in Miracle Mile, we have a power outage. Um, my cameras go on because they are connected to a universal power source. They will continue to record. So keep that in mind or anything else that you wanna have charged. Um, and David, thank you for being so patient. David Mann has a question. All right, thank you. I, there you are. There I am. I mean, I just have to message. It was saying I was using up too much power typing, so I that's why I raised my hand, and that's why I'm talking now. Officer Supreme, I want to respond uh, to you in terms of being called out uh, in in uh, unfortunate uh, tent cities that we see. Uh, Kevin mentioned along Venice Boulevard. I would hope it would be the case to realize that there really is no crime going on, and when you realize there's no crime uh, uh, going on in these tent cities, um, can you then, or will AP, LAPD then uh, automatically refer to the to the the actual social service agency in which you had um, in which you would refer to? So right away, there's an in-person report made by LAPD to the proper social services so that these people can be attended to, uh, you know, without without being sort of branded as criminals. My second question, if I could just get in. Uh, yeah, so for those neighborhoods that actually have private patrols, like Maslin, for example, that has a sign saying, you know, protected by ADT, is it the case that LAPD may once it receives a, a request to come out to, to, in fact, see that that neighborhood has or is being covered by private patrol and therefore uh, not put as such an urgency to show up if other situations happen uh, simultaneously? Well, let, let's start, take your first question first. Um, uh, no, the answer to the question as far as will we reach out to services and so that the uh, unhealthy persons can actually receive it. The answer to that question is no. But who we would reach out to is our council district. Whatever uh, that encampment falls under as far as council district, that's who we will re reach out to. And I'll tell you why. They have something called a care package. What that entails is that you're going to have people from outreach services. You're going to have sanitation. You're going to have someone that can deal with alcohol and drug related issues. This and along with law enforcement, we will set, well, the council just will set up a date and a time where all these resources can actually go to this particular location so that we can assist these unhoused people 
whatever services that they need. Unfortunately, if in fact it is definitely uh, determined that one of the individuals has committed a crime or is wanted by us, then that person will be going to jail versus uh, being sought some kind of housing. So that's how we would address that. So we will know we will not personally get on the phone and start calling outreach services for a person who need it. Now going to the second question, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if there's a community who has private security that patrols that area and you're saying uh, due to them having their own private security, you're saying our response to that location or that area is not gonna be as great because they are already protected by someone private. I just wanna make sure I understand what you're asking. Yes, I was asking that. No, that's not true. But I will say this, in certain communities like one of mine, I know the security company that pro provides service for that community. A lot of times it's good for us to have some kind of lines of communication. So therefore, while I'm at work or that person is at work, if they see something or get a call from a citizen, they can always contact me by phone if I'm at, on duty at the time. And my response versus calling 911 or whomever or non-emergency line will be much faster getting to that call for service by that person who has a direct line of contact with me. So it works really good when certain communities have their own security companies. Cool, thanks. Great answer. And just to, just to piggyback off that with Officer Green, much like that, it, that is entirely not true because I'll patrol here from anywhere from between eight to 16 hour days. And I see plenty of Wilshire units and other units driving up and down the streets when they're not swamped with calls. Um, us with SSA, it's a private patrol. And like, yes, I have me personally, while security officer, I have assisted uh, some of our clients that have had like a bike stolen in that instance, where I may not have caught the guy, but I did find one of the bikes in those instances because, and this is just from experience, is that you have to remember that LAPD is taking those calls, like they've said, somebody's got a knife to you, somebody's got a gun, there's a husband and wife in a brutal fight right now. These are all top priority calls. And as harsh as it sounds, at the end of the day, it sucks that your bike got stolen. I would be mad as I could be if I, my bike got stolen. It's not even that expensive of a bike. It's just that principle of the matter about whether it, you know, you get mad if you lose a dollar or you lose a hundred dollars. Um, but the priority and in law enforcement's response is the safety and the protection of life. So at the end of the day, is your bike really going to, is that the most important thing? Or does the wife that is getting her head bashed into the wall, as brutal as that sounds, by her husband who is either on drugs, drunk, or is just in a fit of rage, does that really take precedent over your bike being stolen? Or, you know, even as silly things like a potted plant. Yeah, I'm going to be mad. And yes, everybody's going to have that answer of, well, you know, why didn't the police come here? But you have to put into perspective that they're swamped there. I, I, I think everybody jokes and, you know, makes jokes that, oh, the, you know, police, the cops, whatever, they're all out, you know, getting their coffee and their donuts when there are guys that will go on a 10, 12, a 14, 16 hour shift and they won't even have time to get a snack in them because the radio is so busy. So it's just one of those things that, even there are days on SSA where I have more mellower days where I can go by, do my checks for my clients, make sure everybody gets to see the car. I, I go around all my areas. And there are some days where clients call and I'm busy with the homeless population, whether they be urinating and defecating in bushes, flashing their genitalia while doing so to the younglings of all these clients that we have. Um, as a security company, we can only do so much as of it being on your property because of liability and everything else like that. But I had an instance last week on Friday evening where a client had called and there was a male sitting on the top of his car yelling and screaming. And it got to the point where he was following women and children and even men walking through there. And I, I forget the, the Jewish holiday that had just passed, but everybody was out. It was a big ordeal in the Jewish community and everybody felt uncomfortable and it put them at a, 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 a complete unease of it. And I responded over there. Again, this guy is sitting on the hood of his car on a public street. There is nothing illegal by any means. And I have no jurisdiction to get in contact with him. 
but I was flagged down by another person who was not a client. And he had told me that this guy had pulled what it was, was either a large razor blade or a pocket knife on him, started yelling derogatory slurs and anti-Semitic slurs against him because he had his yarmulke on and he was with his family. And at that point, there, those are the lines where I got on the phone and called LAPD and I had six to seven units, lights and siren, and I had them there in less than two minutes on a call like that because that's going to take priority because all it takes is one person to turn the corner or even if this guy was around during school hours to grab a child and this is the type of call that needs to be handled. I, so, I, I agree, Officer Liddy, and I think that is an excellent point to um, a jumping point for us to go back to where we started from, which is Neighborhood Watch. And we have to wrap it up here in a minute. And I know everyone's been really patient. This has been hugely informative. I have a few things I want to mention. Um, but before I do, I just wanted a quick, literally 30 second response from each of you, uh, Officer Br uh, Liddy and Officer Green. How, since we have established tonight, everything from please etch your uh, serial number into your bikes and know when to call 911-988 and how would you, we understand we have a gap between the crime that's happening and the limited resources. Do you back and support, uh, you're being arm twisted, but do you back and support an organized neighborhood, an active neighborhood watch where we have blocks that can communicate by text, where we have a neighborhood watch coordinator who communicates with you, Officer Adam Green, who communicates with the private patrol companies? Is this a waste of time or should the people on the call tonight lean in, participate and do their part? This is not a waste of time. What Officer Liddy said, and I just wanna piggyback on something, as far as having that relationship with the senior lead officer, I'm not saying with Wilshire Patrol, having those uh, direct line of contact where he has my cell phone number, I have his, trust me, it works. I'm not saying with Wilshire Patrol, but if in need, you need, and you need to bypass calling 911 or whatever, it's easier to get a hold of that slow who can just pick up that cell phone and take that call. Now, the only downfall with that, unfortunately, we don't work 24 hours. We don't work every single day. So that's the only downfall. But to go back to what you're saying, this is nowhere near a waste of time. This is how a lot of communities should mobilize. Why? Because unfortunately, we're going through some different times. And we're going through some times where the resources are not there as they were many years ago. You have people today that don't even want to do this job, period. And there's a reason for that. But bottom line is, this is a good thing. Thank you very much. And Officer Liddy, from your perspective as a patrol officer for SSA, knowing that you augment that critical gap as well and provide a lot of security support and can escalate calls, what is your take on a neighborhood that is willing to organize with block captains and an active neighborhood watch? Uh, like Officer Green was saying, it's something that I think a lot of people and even, you know, I try to get my neighborhood to do something like this. It's the best thing you can do in any active crime, whether it be as something as silly as they took a garden hose or something heinous like that, the best thing you can possibly do is be the best reporter possible. Because that, at the end of the day, is what's going to give the officers all their information that they need. And if you can give them the nitty gritty, whether it be, you know, it was a Dodgers blue cap, but it had the curve or the curse of LA, something as simple as he had yellow mustard shoes could be the difference of every 87 different people saying 87 different colors on one crime. So it's definitely something in the means of communication to definitely have that window open. Um, I have it with my neighbors. I, my car got egged a couple of weeks ago. My neighbor gave me his ring footage, saw the car there. I gave it to the sheriffs and there we go. Because that's, that's the angle of my camera. I couldn't see it. There you but go. Much like that, 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 you get info like that. That is the message I, we're sending out tonight. So I have a couple quick announcements. Um, one, all the resources are linked in the chat. Take this moment to scroll up and highlight it, copy it. It will take you right to the website. Those are absolutely the best resources at your fingertips. Who to call, when to call, how to get a block captain, what is this neighborhood watch she's talking about, and an email to, directly to me. Uh, we do need block captains. If you do not have a block captain, do, you're not on an island and you're really passing up some valuable resources. So please um, get a block captain or find out who your block captain is. 
Um, do sign up for our Miracle Mile Residential Association newsletter. That's the MMRA newsletter. Um, and you should join the neighborhood, the Residential Association. It's $25 a year. Operation Sparkle. I hope you're listening, everyone. Operation Sparkle is headed up by Tao Tran, who's on this call. She is our block captain, Mid-City West representative, and she is a Miracle Mile board member. She is starting uh, the Operation Sparkle this year. It's on November 12th at 1030, and that involves coming together as a community to clean up parts of Wilshire 8th and 9th. So we hope to see you there. More on that via the newsletter. If you're not signing up for it, you will not find out about it. We have also emergency prep neighborhood team program through the Los Angeles Fire Department and a radio net. Are you aware that we have a radio net? So when we have a uh, communication blackout and nobody has bought the UPS charger I talked about tonight and you can't charge your phone and you can't call anyone on your landline if you still have one, we are growing our radio net. We communicate by shortwave radios. We have monthly check-ins. This is very, very valuable. So please consider not only um, following the three-step neighborhood watch program, but get involved with earthquake and disaster preparedness. It happens all over the world. It happened in Florida. It can happen here. So please let's come together as a community and get prepared. I would like to thank you. Any of the questions that were not asked tonight, answered tonight in the chat, I will do my best to print them out. I want to have a big round of applause for LAPD Officer Adam Green and SSA Officer Brian Liddy. Thank you very much. Unmute yourselves and let's give them a round of applause. Please make sure that they have my contact cell phone number while Anna Shubi is out. Absolutely. I will make sure of that. And I want to thank you all for coming together as a community tonight. We are safer when we are together. So please. Help me help you. Thank you so much and have a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Have a good evening.